well, we're here with Dr. Ellen Towns Anderson, uh, one of uh, Dr. Charles Towns' four daughters, are here at the uh, Rutgers New Jersey Medical School, and want to thank you so much for your time and agreeing to share some insights. Uh, it's an important time. Uh, how, My how, pleasure. How are you and your family uh, handling all this, uh, the acclaim and the remembrance now of the, the event at Berkeley's coming up in a couple of weeks? Well, he was 99, so, you know, it wasn't a shock, although he, when he died, but he wanted to live very much to 100. So uh, one of his colleagues figured out that he had actually lived 99.501 <laughs> years, rounded up would be 100. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, we enjoyed that joke and, and uh, felt better about that. Um, it's still always a loss, and um, we had a wonderful service at his church in Berkeley, and um, uh, were able to interact with the minister and provide uh, vignettes of our father and our life with him, and uh, share a religious service, which, I mean, he attended church very consistently. He prayed and read the Bible every day of his life, as far as I know. Um, so, because he was fairly advanced in age, I think it, it, that helped in losing him. Um, but we recently, as a family, also buried half of his ashes up at his farm in New Hampshire. And that was just a family, and that was wonderful. Uh, the other half will be buried down in uh, South Carolina with his southern relatives his mother and father and so forth. Well, you were just uh, we were talking briefly about the event, uh, the two-day event that's going to be held in his, uh, in his honor at Berkeley, uh, Lasers, Light, and Legacy, I believe it's called. Yes. Although um, the organizer had said that lasers are perhaps a smaller portion of the focus, given that so many people know his legacy, but his, his influence is much broader and his interests were far broader. Right. Well, when he went to Berkeley, uh, he really changed fields into astrophysics and astronomy and made several fundamental discoveries, as far as I know. I'm not really an expert on his scientific legacy, but uh, in discovering um, molecules in space, including ammonia and water, and, um, and then <clears throat> working on um, discussing the presence and size of the black hole at the center of the galaxy. And at the end of his career, he was looking at the changes in the size of stars. And with all that, he was using lasers, um, but his questions were quite different. Um, and I think he always felt that it turned out to be a wonderful transition. Uh, he liked to move to new things. I, he said that, you know, many times himself that, ooh, 10 years in one area is enough. I got to move on and do something else. Um, so when he moved to California, that was a transition into other areas um, where I think he made significant contributions as well. Um, and he was developing some uh, telescopes that used large mirrors and lasers to be able to sort of pinpoint um, things in space and was using infrared infotometry which I think kind of opened up a new field, and some of his colleagues are still using that technique. Um, what was your question? <laughs> uh, we were just, just talking about um, um, his, his, his Broader legacy. broad spectrum right. of legacy and, right. and interest. Um, it's interesting that one of his postdocs went into neuroscience, uh, even. So they didn't all stay in physics or um, astronomy, um, and some went into industry, uh, some started businesses. Um, so he had a lot of students, and in that way um, influenced a lot of people, and uh, many of them went on to do wonderful things. So it was a broad legacy, I would say. And you said actually a lot of the people who would be speaking on day one of this event are a lot of his uh, successful grad students, and, and their information will be news to you as well a little bit. Absolutely, because as I said, um, 
family was not in the lab. <laughs> so we didn't know that much about what was going on in the lab. Uh, now you're one of four siblings, or yes, you have three sisters. Right. Did any of the others follow into your, somewhat, your, your path into sciences? Well, my older sister is a developmental psychologist. Um, and recently working uh, in a home for troubled children, children with autism and so forth. Um, then there's me, uh, and I call myself a neurobiologist. Mm -hmm. And then my next sister uh, was a teacher, middle school teacher, and uh, some years she taught science, but her spe specialty was English. And then the youngest daughter, um, my youngest sister, is a mechanical engineer and works on energy conservation um, with a company that looks at commercial buildings. So in some ways, we all touch on science, um, maybe not directly, but obliquely. I'm probably the most directly scientific academic. Um, but all my sisters had advanced degrees, and, and my parents thought education was extremely important and encouraged us and supported us in that. So, You say you weren't in the lab as a family, of course, but uh, how did uh, your father impart um, his curiosities or did he, was it kind of natural or did he impart particular lessons to you? And your mother, if I may say as well, also has uh, some particularly deep interests. And, uh, she does. <laughs> um, well, he um, he. I'll, I'll give you an example of how he imparted um, sort of a general interest in science and the natural world. I think that's where we interacted with him more. Um, in middle school, I was doing a project on spiders for my biology class, and so he helped me for several weeks go out into the yard and collect spiders and we put them into jars and we kept them alive and one of them had babies and so forth. And so, you know, just his enthusiasm, because frankly I don't, didn't like spiders, still don't like spiders, but doing it with him was lots of fun and kind of, you know, uh, maybe much more enthusiastic. And of course, eventually I went into biology. So, uh, And so he did that, I think, w with all of us, worked uh, or played with us um, in terms of the natural world, and he, when he bought this farm, one of his um, hopes and visions was that, that we would have more of a chance to experience the natural world and explore, um, and that we and our children and our children's children, so uh, he felt exploration was wonderful. But he, he was a very, um, upbeat, curious guy who loved to play. And play is really a form of exploration. And so he would play with us all the time. And he loved sparklers and dressing up and roughhousing and so forth. And so um, all of that, I think, was the spirit of sort of enthusiasm and enjoying life and the world and, and um, exploration. When did it be kind of begin to sink in that your father was kind of a, a big deal in, in the scientific world? Did, did any of that kind of trickle in? Uh, it only trickled in when he got the Nobel Prize. I really didn't uh, know. I mean, he was provost at MIT at the time, which was a significant administrative position. Um, I was aware of that because I was dating an MIT <laughs> student. Uh, but sort of an international prominence, no, we didn't have a sense of that until the Nobel Prize. Um, and we all got to go to Sweden and uh, dress up, <laughs> go to parties, and, um, and we met Martin Luther King. It was the same year that Martin Luther King Jr. got the Peace Prize. So I think it really wasn't till then, and I was in college, um, so it was somewhat later in life um, for for us. Uh, and I think, uh, thankfully, I'm not sure uh, 
having celebrities for parents is certainly not necessary and, and I'm not sure it's that helpful actually you just want them to be your parent so <laughs> yeah. both your parents uh, wrote uh, memoirs um, father wrote about how the laser came to be and your mother wrote about being the adventures of a scientist's wife essentially and yeah. and she she uh, advocates has advocated for for uh, youth I'm just wondering if you if you if you had a part in in reading those books or helping edit those books and no. Okay. <laughs> um, my mother, though, it, you're right. She all her life did volunteer things, and when she moved to Berkeley, she felt moved to get involved with homeless youth. Uh, it was a big problem. Um, they were there in the '60s. Um, a lot of agitation going on, a lot of young people moving to Berkeley, and homelessness um, of young people was a, was a big issue on the streets of Berkeley. And she took that up um, and continued that for many, many years, raising money. Um, actually, some of the Templeton Award that my father got went you know, to that cause. Uh, and worked with um, housing them and feeding them and being with them. She is a very approachable, non-judgmental, open kind of person and was able to relate to them um, in a way that I uh, really admire. Uh, and she's always, as I said, kind of been involved in social activities and I think that spilled out to all of us. All of us have also always been involved in various kinds of um, uh, non-profit organizations and other kinds of things to, to help uh, one way or another. Uh, Spe speaking of uh, documentation of, of, of your father's history and your family's history to some extent, um, I'm sure you're aware of the oral history interviews conducted in 1991-1992. They reside yes. at the Bancroft Library at, at Berkeley. I'm just curious if you've been, if, it, if you had read through all those, or if, if um, I will be sending people over to, to read it. It's, it's quite um, it's candid a, and extensive. It's a tome. <laughs> um, my father always sent us things that he published and speeches and so forth. Um, I tended not to look at those too much, uh, and I was I felt close to my father, and uh, when I was in Berkeley at school, I would have dinner after church on Sundays with him every week, and uh, and I I guess I preferred the living person. <laughs> yeah. um, since his death, um, I have started to look at some of that stuff um, and realize that there were things about him that I didn't know and and maybe wished I'd known more. Um, but at the time, I I just was present. It was in the present. Um, and I don't know about my other sisters, but I'm guessing it's a similar sort of uh, thing. Um, so we have all those things to look at, um, as well as our own memories and uh, family photos and so forth. So that's kind of nice. We have a, a rich depository of things uh, to jog our memories or even create new ones. <laughs> Have you ever had occasion to use a laser in any of your work? Yes. Huh? Um, in the mid-90s, my father, my father always asked me about my work and always said, please send me your published papers, which I did, and he would always say, oh, they were very interesting, but I couldn't understand them. <laughs> But in the mid-90s, he said, um, you know, have you thought about using something called the optical trap or the optical tweezers? And I kind of said, well, no. And I kind of looked it up and thought, hmm. And he helped me set up a meeting with Arthur Ashkin, who was the inventor of the optical tweezers. I was working at Cornell at the time uh, in the Department of Physiology there. And my colleague and I went out to visit 
are the Ashton, and see his optical tweezer set up and everything at Bell Labs. Um, and he showed us um, images of tweezers uh, interacting with biological material and nerve cells. And I had developed the idea that we might be able to move nerve cells. So I was able to get uh, money from NIH to try this out and, and bought an optical tweezers set up by a company um, that was kind of a startup company. And we proceeded to try to move nerve cells. And I would um, occasionally see my father and show him the videos of um, you know, what we were trying to do and cells were spinning out of the trap and you know, it kind of wasn't working. And eventually we were able to develop a substrate on a glass plate uh, to which the cells would not stick. So our biggest problem was that when you put cells down, um, they wouldn't remain in suspension, they would slowly sink down, and then they would stick. And the tweezers was not powerful enough to overcome that adhesion. Mm. So we developed a substrate that was completely non-adherent to the cells. And the substrate is the same thing that's used for contact lenses. So the contact lens will not stick to your cornea. <laughs> um, and then we started to be able to pick up whole nerve cells. And these were huge neurons. They came from salamanders. And salamanders have the largest nerve cells in the vertebrate kingdom. So these are very big cells. And we picked up all kinds of cells. And then we developed experiments saying, well, if we can pick them up and move them, maybe we can create clusters of nerve cells that of our choosing to watch their interactions, uh, which we proceeded to do. And we published a paper in which I cited two of my father's papers, and I've never since been able to cite, you know, we just are in different fields, because he had written a paper uh, saying that the um, optical maser should be useful in medical practices. Um, and then I subsequently did more work with optical tweezers, and um, now I've had a graduate student who's worked on using the optical tweezers to move nerve cells on a microelectrode array mm. so that we can place nerve cells at precise points on the electrodes, which isn't possible. Usually they just drop nerve cells onto the microelectrode array and the placement is very random. Mm. But with the tweezers, we were able to move them and we had to get special MEAs that have, you have to use particular kinds of glass and so forth. But anyway, it all worked and that's not published yet. So he started me on that, you asked, and uh, it's it's not a main thrust for me, but it turned out to be really a lot of fun, um, and uh, I think we're the first to move whole nerve cells. Um, people have moved parts of nerve cells, but not the, not the whole thing. So anyway, it was fun sharing with him. I would bring the videos and say, well, what do you make of this, or what do you think is happening here? <laughs> And mainly, it was his interest uh, that he gave me. He couldn't really give me a lot of answers. Um, so we just plowed on and <laughs> eventually made it work. So, uh, yeah. So that's a little piece of kind of collaboration that I treasure. <laughs>